Hi, Greg. This is Ingrid talking about Rear Window today. Um, I just met with my group and we had a really good meeting about how influential this movie is into film history. And I really appreciate you letting me do my presentation online and sending it to you. I appreciate your understanding of my situation to not attend class tomorrow night. But Rear Window, it's a super thick movie, as you said before the film presentation on Thursday. Um, very much heightens the male gaze onto the world around him. And, you know, as I read things online and talked to my parents about this movie, I really, um, you know, was able to think about the perspectives that are allowed in this movie and how Hitchcock really controls the audience, how we are able to view the character of Jeffries, but also how Jeffries views the world. So it's like an inception of viewing, which is super cool. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize for my face tattoos Halloween weekend and they haven't come off yet. So, but, um, I just want to talk about, we picked the scene of when Jeffries writes the note to Thornwald and Grace Kelly brings it over to his apartment. And we felt like that scene did a very good job of cutting back and forth to heighten the suspense of Jeffries and the nurse over at Jeffries' apartment with the camera waiting for Grace Kelly to drop off the note in Thornwald's apartment and how she moves out of frame in the back of the hallway and he pops out to see who left the note and how she runs downstairs and we see her frame pop out of the out of the frame well he comes out of the frame in the window shootings of how their bodies go out and in it really stimulates the audience we really liked that and also how the camera pans back and forth on Thornwald's window and then goes back to Jeffrey's heightening his perspective of the situation and his emotion inflicted by it in the meeting that the audience is um, getting from the scene. Also, um, you know, when they are creating the note, the bird's eye view onto it just heightens the intensity for the audience and how significant this note could be that Jeffrey's is about to, you know, tempt the enemy and the murderer of, you know, suspecting killing his wife to now know that Jeffries is on to him, which even heightens the suspense for the audience in realizing the re resolution of the movie. Also, um, this movie does a lot with the cool shove effect. You know, we've talked about that in class. We talked about it in the book, but you know, a face shot with the faces seeing coming back on the face shot with the faces seeing. So it's like we're viewing a viewing. It's, you know, like I said, you know, in silly ways, it's like the inception of viewing. We're able to be controlled on what we see by what, you know, the main character is seeing. And it just gives us a sense of placement within the movie. And we are very involved in the actions that are being made. And, you know, throughout this movie, there's tons of continuity edi editing and cross-cutting in reference to how Jeffries, when he's in, um, in the beginning of the movie, when we are meeting the neighbors... We are, you know, panning across the back rear apartment complex, going into these different lives of his neighbors. And we, you know, this specific um, example of continuity editing is when the woman is having dinner with herself and she is drinking a glass of wine and Jeffrey is himself is drinking a glass of wine. And, you know, he is honoring her even though he she is having dinner by herself, which is a very interesting perspective to be allowed into. And Hitchcock brings us into many different worlds of the neighbors. You know, one neighbor is sleeping outside on the deck, and one situation of another neighbor is a ballet dancer who dances all over the place and acts very ditzy. Another portrayal of the thematic, in my perspective, a very thematic approach to sexism. The women in this movie are not portrayed in a very you know, light and happy way. They're either portrayed as the ballerina dancer, someone who's just dumb and dances all over the place, or the newlywed couple with the woman who just constantly wants to have sex with her husband and her husband comes to the window for air and she's just calling him back to her. Or the, you know, the couple that lives up on the deck, the two are, you know, very strange and they live, you know, they sleep outside and have a dog that goes down from a basket and, you know, the neighbors on the bottom floor, one falls asleep in the lawn chair, very oblivious to what is going on with the newspaper over her head. And the one woman who, you know, seems very insane heightens mental illness and instability. And then we meet Grace Kelly, who is a completely divine in her portrayal. She just seems like everything is perfect and everything is fine. 
And, you know, she comes in and she's very attentive to her boyfriend who seems like kind of an ass who's just sitting in his wheelchair with his broken leg, you know, being a peeping Tom at the neighbors. But that's another thing that I read online and when I was talking with other people is that Jeffries is a voyeur, voyeur, a voyeur, or some someone who just is gazing on the world for either pleasure or sexual pleasure. And since he is a, his character in the movie is a photographer to start out with, he is using his skills to you know view the world in a different way than he is used to. So um, he wants to. He takes his camera and he's you know getting a closer look on things around him, feeling that it is his duty to maybe report or just keep track of what's going on around him since he's more aware of that now because of his broken leg and his injury where he is forced to sit in a chair all day long. But, um, yeah, in, especially in the key scene that we chose before the note is written, how Grace Kelly is framed compared to the nurse and Jeffrey sitting in the wheelchair. Jeffrey is, you know, down in most of these shots. There's either Kelly in the middle Nurse on one side, and Jeffries is the lowest on the right side of the frame. Just highlighting how Kelly, no matter what she does, she's just so incredibly perfect. Her dinners are perfect. Her outfits are perfect. What she says is perfect. So that is translucent through the framing of her persona and how she is influencing and presiding and authoritizing the behavior of her boyfriend with the nurse on what to do with Thornwald in this very suspenseful situation. So... You know, since she is giving off this, you know, presiding authoritative vibe, it sort of makes sense that she would, you know, travel across the courtyard and go into Thornwald's place to also change the thematic representation of women throughout the movie that they can take control of the situation. They can fulfill a goal and they can get stuff done other than just being a pretty face that might be a little bit mentally unstable. Um... You know, as we have talked about in class, that editing is a very mysterious way of conveying meaning through film. Many different meanings can be conveyed or represented and illustrated through the audience. Audience can have many different perceptions of what is going on and the meanings created. And Hitchcock does such a great job of editing his movies to make sh to elicit a certain response from his audience, and not really choosing which response to go off of. He elicits many responses, but it's, it's what he's known for you know, many different um, illustrations that he's trying to convey in his own way. And, you know, as historians say that his um, Hitchcock did not want this movie to be released during his lifetime, he believed that this movie was something that it really bothered him, that someone could easily just look into his apartment and see anything that is going on, He, you know, without being aware that his rear window is open. So he wanted this movie to be released when he was no longer alive, so he wouldn't have to deal with the reaction of it. If people were going to be more aware of something that was going on behind them, or if they they themselves will look out the back, their, um, back, looking out their window. So, all in all, this movie is very thick with imagery. It goes back and forth to many different perspectives. It guides the audience along in kind of a way where they don't even know it. They're just, I know, on the edge of their seats, real, you know figuring out what is going to happen as we look through the eyes of Jeffries and the perception of him through the gaze of him out his window to the perception of Grace Kelly, who brings a feminine approach to this movie that, you know, is somewhat negative in the beginning with her very attentive behavior and, you know, kind of getting pushed around by his, her old curmudgeon boyfriend in his wheelchair, but in the end showing that, you know, women are more than they are portrayed to be in a negative way and can really take home the the prize when trying to solve a mystery or a crime or anything. So um, let me see if there's anything else. Also in this scene, it's very interesting because Hitchcock appears in the scene. He appears in the camera panning over to one of the neighbors at his piano and Hitchcock emerges at the mantle, looking at the clock. So that is just a very interesting, trivial cameo that Hitchcock pulls in his film. And in this scene, um, 
you know, as I've said in my analysis, the Hitchcock really pulls our strings throughout the entire thing, especially towards the end of the movie where Thornwald comes into um, Jeffrey's apartment and the pace of the cutting quickens up. It goes quickly. So our suspense is really heightened. You know, is he going to fall out the window? Is he going to break both of his legs? He's going to die. What is going on? Is Thornwald going to get caught? Will the police reach him in time? And so the fast pacing editing in the end of that movie really brings it full fold to give it the big finale that it deserves with the renowns that it is faced in editing. And I think that is what I have in my notes. You know, and back to the, you know, sexism theme, the time this movie made, the movie was made was in 1954 when the roles of, you know, social roles of women and men were very different. You know, men were the breadwinners and women stayed home with the children and stayed home and cooked and cleaned and care took care of the house. And as time has progressed, that is, you know, not as, you know, as typical and more women are going out and getting jobs and, you know, feeling as though they have some purpose and voice in the world. But, you know, in 1954, that viewpoint was a lot different. So this movie, I think, highlights that, how, you know, viewpoints were back then compared to now. And, um, yeah, you know, I love this movie. It was the first Hitchcock movie I've ever seen, and I saw it in class, and I was really thankful for that. And just today I bought Psycho and the Birds at Target. So I'm going to be more engaged in Hitchcock's work. I think he does a really great job, and now I know why my parents are such huge fans. So thank you, Greg, for letting me present this to you over um, email on video recording, and if you have any other questions about my opinions or perceptions or analyses of the movie, please let me know. Um, thank you. Have a good night.